Every time our athletes walk into this weight room, they're going to be pushed to the max. Let's go! Let's go! The barbell hasn't changed in over 100 years. I can take a 25-pound plate, and we'll go out on the turf, and I'll, I'll have you hating life. We talk about straining your gut, pushing past that comfort level. I want a lot of energy. What better breeding ground is there for being a success in life than the weight room? Hey guys, welcome back to Iron Game Chalk Talk. I'm your host, Ron McKeefrey, and this is episode number 317. I want to thank you guys for listening each week. Really appreciate those of you that like, share, comment. Just continues to help us highlight the great people that we have in our profession. Also want to thank our sponsor, Train Heroic, for bringing this episode to you for free. Uh, only partner with companies that I believe in both the people and the product, and Train Heroic has a fantastic product, but they have even better people. So if you're in the market, reach out to them. If not, just let them know how much you appreciate them for being a part of the show. This week, I'm joined by Garrett Keith. He's the head strength conditioning coach at Westminster Christian Academy in Alabama. He's also the reigning NHSSCA strength coach of the year and uh, just a guy that's a family man, a great coach, and doing it all the right way. And appreciate you coming on the show, man. And I appreciate it. Um, I, I told you before, man, this is really a huge deal to me uh, being a part of this this podcast. Years ago, I I heard you speak at a clinic in Louisville, and um, I kept hearing people talk about your podcast. I didn't even know what a podcast was at the time. And um, I was in my wife's car, and it had Bluetooth, and uh, my, my car at the time didn't. So I get in the car on the way on the drive back home, and I was like, i got to find this Iron Game Chalk Talk podcast thing. So I downloaded it, and I listened to it on the way home just for hours, just episode after episode, which just mesmerized. And I got home and I told my wife, I got to go get a new new radio deck for my, my Jeep. She's like, what? I was like, man, I, I listen to this podcast and, and I'm wasting time listening to music every day in the, in the car. I got to I gotta get on this. And, and so it, it really helped me on my education stream um, because now, you know, listen to a ton of different podcasts, obviously, including Iron Game Chalk Talk. And it was a big game changer for me. No, it's, I mean, it's such an awesome story. And I mean, that's it's absolutely why I do this, um, you know, is to try to make an impact any way I can and had people that had made an impact on me and, and uh, just uh, that, that fills me up when I hear that kind of stuff. But uh, I think I might've only got you beat by maybe a couple of years on learning what a podcast was at that point, but, um, but I'm with you. I'm with you. Well, man, you, you, uh, you've had a, a really cool career. I mean, you, you played football at North, North Alabama, right? Yes, sir. Uh, and then went to American. And you've been in the high school realm the, the, the whole time. Mm -hmm. uh, which either stop in that journey as an athlete or American or, or there at Westminster or which sport has had the most impact on you becoming the coach that you are today? You know, it, it's hard to say because my stop, when I was at ACA, which was where I played high school at, was really important to me because the, the Patriot head on the side of that helmet meant a lot to me because that's, you know, the one I wore when I was in high school. But there I was really just um, a strength coach for the football team. I didn't understand strength and conditioning well enough to um, really train everybody and I didn't, wouldn't have felt comfortable. So being here at Westminster where I get to work with all of our athletes has, has probably been my area of biggest growth. Uh, this is starting my 11th year here and there's been so much, uh, so many athletes that have come through now that uh, I've learned from and, and been able to adapt our program and had coaches come by and, and obviously my, my experience with different organizations and, and especially the NHS SCA is, helped me to grow tremendously. Um, so I would, I would say my time here at Westminster has been huge for me um, and the kind of support that I've got from our administration and our coaches staff and, and the teachers and, and everybody in the community has been great for me. Yeah, there's a lot to dig in there, you know, being, a, at a, at, at, being in high school strength and conditioning for 14 years or 15 years, whatever it's been now. Um, I mean, that's that, that wasn't as popular 15 years ago as it is as, as it is today. So that's we want to dig into that. But before we do, we always always like to dig into the, the, the biggest mistake. You know, what's the biggest mistake you've made as a coach and how you've learned from it? Because I think it helps other coaches that are listening help avoid some of those mistakes potentially down the line. From a program standpoint, I would say that my biggest mistake was, was kind of the same thing. And it was when I was at ACA, my my first 
year or two coaching, you know, I didn't really know what I was doing. I was hired to be an offensive line and defensive line coach. They were changing offenses, and it was the offense that I played in at UNA my senior year. And my, my former head coach was just like, I got to have you come in. And you loved the weight room when you were in high school, which was really the reason I ever had a chance to play at the next level. And uh, he said, you're going to run the weight room. It's like, okay, that'd be great. I love it. And all I was doing was copying and pasting things that I had done in the past. I didn't didn't really know how to set up a program, and and I guess that's where my education started. But it was just you know the whiteboard, and everybody did the same workout. And then a couple of years into it, I had a kid, Harrison Pollard, who you may recognize the name Ben Pollard, who was yeah. at several yeah. different stops, uh, great mentor of mine, great friend of mine. Harrison, his oldest son, was one of my athletes, and he was playing baseball. And he came in, and I would have kids that during baseball season would come in before school started to lift, and it was it was a squat day, so everybody's going to squat, and they're all going to do the same squat. And, and he came in, and early in the morning, he did his squats, and they had a baseball game that afternoon. And I remember going to that baseball game, and he hit a ball, and he starts running down the first baseline, and his hamstring pops. And all I could do in the stands was sit and think about, did I do the best thing for that kid that day? And it really, and Coach Pollard was awesome about it. He didn't blame me. He didn't say anything negative to me about it. He was still my buddy and, and was still a mentor. Um, but it ate me up inside because to see one of the athletes that I love be injured and think that I had something to do with it just drove me insane. So it drove me to, try to educate myself a lot more about how to train in season athletes and how to prepare them properly, the rest and recovery that was needed and how to do a better job of programming. And it's one of those things that I still have talked to Harrison about today. He's, he actually came up um, to my awards ceremony a few weeks ago and, and to have him there was really cool. Um, but it, it didn't change our relationship, but it, it helped me be a better coach for sure. Yeah, I think that's something that we all go through, and I think we can all become better at, at programming and, and continually researching what we're doing and challenging our ideals. I think that's, I mean, that's the mark of a good coach. With uh, being at Westminster, you know, you've had, you know, you, you, you've been a combination of football and strength, but you've also uh, brought in all the other sports, you know, and, and being a guy that was – you know, just like me, I mean, my, my passion is football. I mean, I, I, would, I would often tell people that I was a football coach just put in the weight room. Um, working with the other sports had, had to have made you grow as a coach and, and, uh, and challenge you. What, you know, that football player, that, that quarterback is probably that pitcher or shortstop. He's also maybe, you know, uh, a sprinter or whatever it may be. How are you going about creating programs um, for the multi-sport athlete? So for our multi-sport athletes, you know, it's for a lot of them, it's still GPP. Um, we're not doing a, a ton of sports specialization with our kids. Um, we'll do some things to, to help with injury prevention or, or trying to, to armor their body as much as possible for things that, that um, are common to the injuries to their positions or to their sports. Um, but for the majority of our kids, you know, just the general strengthening of, of our, our normal lifts and, and the core and understanding the deceleration mechanics and things of that nature are pretty general for them. Now, obviously, we, we block them off by training age and by in-season and out-of-season, uh, competition season, those kind of things. But as far as um, getting too far down the rabbit hole of, of specification for sports, it's not something that we really do. And it's worked well for our kids, and they enjoy it. How do you, you know, how do you program or, or you know, or, or change your schedule based off of in-season versus out-of-season? Are, are you broken? Are you teaching classes throughout the day that are strength and conditioning courses? Yes. So throughout the day, I've got ninth through 12th grade classes that are co-ed. Uh, they're not split up by sport or, or anything like that. So from in my zero period class, which starts before school, I can have a ninth grader this is their first day at our school, first day in the weight room, and I'll have a senior that's been in the program since they were in eighth grade, just a you know, starting middle linebacker or whatever. Um, so it, it varies a lot in the class, but then we'll just break them down by block zero to block three and, and obviously the different times of year. 
So you so you're breaking up that that class by uh, level of, of skill, um, and from there, are you breaking it up in season versus out of season? Yes, sir. So half of my weight room in each class will be uh, the in season athletes. The other half will be off season, out of season athletes, and um, they'll train in racks together as as far as with their with their uh, teams as much as possible. But, you know, there, there's some classes where I'll have one volleyball player and she's the only volleyball player. So she's going to train. Uh, she may be training with some other in season female athletes, or she may be at a, a rat by herself where other people are helping to spot her when necessary and things like that. Yeah. I think that's always a challenge to keep, um, you know, it's absolutely the right way to do things, but it's also challenging keeping everybody's attention and keeping them, you know, engaged in what their goals are for that time, that training period. What are some some tactics that you've used to try to keep everybody doing what they're supposed to be doing and, and essentially coaching themselves as well? So years ago, um, I would have three different stopwatches, and I've been having a stopwatch on my phone going, trying to get the rest times ready for each group when I'm blowing a whistle for racks one through two, set three, go, and, and these racks. And, and finally, uh, and one of my observations with Fred Eves, I went up to Battleground Academy when Fred was there, and um, he had just gotten a timer, and, and I'd heard Kevin Vanderbush talk about his timing system, and, and um, Fred kind of laid out to me how he used his, and, and the next week I bought a timer, and that was something that's helped me not have to watch the clock, but, but be able to go around and coach athletes all day long. Um, so I've got great kids as far as the, the motivation that's needed. Um, I don't have to be a big rah-rah guy in the weight room. I'll explain to them the purpose of what we're doing. You know, they, they know what we're doing. We use a team builder so they can see their workouts at home. They can, the, a lot of them will come in knowing what their weights and what their reps are already. Cause they looked at it that morning. They wanted to get their mind right before they got in. So I'll say, all right, guys, we'll go through our prep work and first set and we'll, we'll start the clock and they'll just get going, and they know the pace that they have to keep it on to make sure they're getting their work done by the end of the, the tier time. You know, uh, 11 years at a place, I'm sure it, it's changed quite a bit from year one to where it is now in terms of maybe facilities or scheduling classes or getting buy-in from parents, administration, coaches. What were some of those challenges early, and, and how have you gone about kind of addressing some of those as, you, as you've grown? So the first year I got here, uh, it wasn't what I thought it was going to be. Um, I really thought I was going to be teaching classes like I am now all day long, but I was in a classroom teaching health classes and watching a couple of study halls. And we had a first period middle school athletics block and an eighth period high school athletics block. And at that time, that eighth period high school athletics block was a big babysitting class, basically. I had sport coaches that were kind of helping me, but in, in their defense, the weight room and, and training wasn't their passion. Their passion was volleyball or football or base, whatever it was. But they were kind of in charge of different groups, and I would tell them what to do with them. And, and I kept going to our administration. And after year two and I think after year three again, and said, this is, this is not working. And it's not about me. It's about we're not doing the best that we can for our athletes. We're asking them to dedicate this time, and we're not giving them a chance to be successful. So. I think it was year four maybe they finally started giving me some classes that I was able to train kids throughout the day and it just grew from there to where now last year was the first year we offered a, a zero block period so we started at seven o'clock before school and it's run just like a class and when I went to my administration and asked them for it, it was because we've got such a high acad academic standard at Westminster that some of our kids that were wanting to get in my class couldn't get into it because they had to take so many AP classes in foreign languages. And they said, coach, do you really think anybody's going to sign up for a class that meets at seven? I said, let's find out. And it was my biggest class. It's, it's filled to compa it's been filled to capacity every semester. Um, so that's been a major change. And, and it's been cool. We've got a, a, the guy that took over for me as the offensive line coach is actually a guy that was here in eighth grade, my first year here. And graduated from Westminster and was one of my my top cats. The the posters that you see on the back behind me are, are is a way that I honor kids every year that have 
kind of stood out above everybody else with their work ethic, their dedication to the program. And he was one of my uh, first top cats and he's back here coaching now. So it's fun to talk to him and say, Hey, you remember when we, when we used to do that? He goes, yeah, you don't do that anymore. Why don't, why don't you do that anymore? And I get to explain it to him and, and uh, just a great guy to have around. Yeah. That's, that's awesome right there. When you can, when you can have your athletes come back through um, or go on into coaching or, or something along those lines, that's some of the most rewarding uh, moments for sure. So, so this year, coach, we actually, in our faculty meeting yesterday, I looked around and we had two new hires and those two new hires, plus the, the guy that's been here for a year, were all three, three of my top cats. Um, so to be able to have them together and, and be here at the school is pr- really cool. That's fantastic. Well, I would imagine that's helped, obviously, with, with getting buy-in even now. But, I mean, early on, getting peer acceptance from other faculty members and, and the importance of strength and conditioning and why that would even be on par with some of these foreign languages and other, other courses, it's probably been a challenge. What, how have you gone about building credibility uh, for the courses that you're teaching and, and for the profession in general? So first of all, I think it's important to be seen throughout the school, um, not making the weight room your, your little area that you don't ever venture out of. Um, you know, obviously my first few years I was in the classrooms in the main school building, but uh, making sure that, that you're at, we, we're a Christian school, so make sure you're at chapel all the time. Make sure you're doing all the things um, that you're supposed to. You're supportive of all of the academics. Um, you're supportive of, of the fine arts programs and the different things that are going on. Um, but being really transparent with my administration was a big part of it. Uh, Toby Jacoby did a great article for the NHSSCA website uh, a couple of years ago that was about using educational language in the weight room and understanding that, that we as strength coaches use that education or we are doing what your normal classroom teachers are doing. But a lot of times we don't understand how to speak that language. And, and Gary Schofield does a great job of, of saying, Hey, if I was hired by uh, a, a German national team to train their pro train their, their swim team, the first thing I would do isn't a sports analysis and understanding what they need physically. It would be to learn German and so I could speak their language. So as a high school strength coach, it's important for me to understand edu- educational language and be able to speak that to my administration. Because when they hear that, they, they butt up and they go, okay, this guy knows what he's doing. So two or three years ago, my, my principal came to me and asked me to take half of our faculty in the morning and then take the other half in the afternoon and take them through professional development to show them how I break down our classes, the character and leadership development that we're doing, the differentiation that we're doing, the assessments that we're doing, summative assessments, formative assessments, all those kind of things. And it was amazing the response I had from the faculty because everybody supported me and that they were great to me. But after those meetings, I had multiple teachers that that came up to me as a coach. I had no idea. I thought y'all just pick things up and put them down. You know, I, I, I didn't understand the breakdown that you have in here. And then I had teachers that came and observed my classes and wanted to know how they could do in their classroom what I was doing in the weight room, how they could differentiate for their different students' needs. And, you know, they may have a class that's all juniors, but even in that junior class, there's a big, big difference in abilities. Um, and so to be able to do that with ninth or 12th graders in the weight room, really shocked them. Um, so that's, that's, I guess, been one of the biggest things for me was showing that my administration that, you know, what we do in here is important more than just physically, but there's a lot of preparation that goes into it for the mentality of the kids and for their confidence levels and for them understanding that there's a reason behind what we're doing. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I know, I know Gary and I talk about it a lot, a lot but I think he did a great job, at least while he's at GA, um, Greater Atlanta Christian School, but of creating lesson plans, you know, with course objectives and and and, and skills that, that they needed to master and those types of things and putting it into that format and not just saying, we're going to get stronger in eight weeks or we're going to get faster in eight weeks, you know, um, but laying that out. And I think combining that with really educating at the, um, 
and staying current with the current uh, research that's being done around physical activity with retention or physical activity with focus and, and how that benefits um, those other uh, professors or teachers um, by having some sort of physical activity throughout the day is a benefit. It's not a, it's not a detraction. And I think as we try to continue to create strength and conditioning jobs at the high school level, it's going to take that kind of language and it's going to take that kind of um, vision by coaches to show what can be done to benefit the student, you know, in not just their athletic pursuits, but also their academic pursuits. Yeah. As we can. I know a big part of that for you and, and um, you know, obviously within our company with having two of the, the board members um, with Gary and Rich, but the NHSSCA has, has done quite a bit to, to kind of rally the troops and, and, and start to kind of, you know, share some of that common language across the board. What has the NHSSCA been able to do for you individually and, and how do you feel like it could help maybe some high school coaches or coaches thinking about going to the high school level that, that maybe are unfamiliar? You know, for me, it, it opened up a lot of relationships. And, you know, Michael Courage talks about this all the time, but I hate to drop Gary bombs. But, but Gary has been so influential in my career. And one of the things that he says all the time is information is a dime a dozen. You can get on the Internet now and find tons of great information. But the connections that we have made through the NHSSCA, I think, are one of the greatest benefits to it. Um, with, with great coaches from all over the country, whether it's in the Northeast Regional or the Southeast Regional or the Na National Conference, the ability to, to connect with other coaches who are going through a lot of the similar things that, that we are. You know, I was a, a part of some other conferences for many years where I would go and, and I'd listen to a coach that was in collegiate setting or the professional setting, and it was really cool to hear them because you look up to these guys. You know, you, you look to – um, the, the professional guys and think, wow, how, you know, they've done it really awesome, but they start talking about their programming and, and different things and it just doesn't fit for a high school program. So, you know, there's tons of guys I've been able to learn from that I don't know that I ever would have met if it weren't for the NHSSCA. Um, in fact, we, we've got a, a coach's Bible study that was started because of a connection that was made to the NHSSCA and, and we've, formed a group called the Iron Circle that we actually met this morning at, for 5 a.m. for me that we get on a video conference call and, and just build into each other. It started at the NatCon two years ago and we ended up forming 10 people and now we've got 50 people. We're having to split up into different groups and um, those connections have been huge and the ability to learn from other coaches has been uh, you know, my, monumental in my career. That's fantastic. And the one thing that you and I share, um, I think you just, I think you just made a post not too long ago um, talking about the, the impact that some of the female coaches had on your daughters or, or, you know, and just, uh, yeah, that was really cool. And I, um, you know, obviously I have two daughters and, and I want them to grow up to feel like they can do anything, accomplish anything. And, and I also think that this field provides a unique opportunity for our, our children to be, around a diverse population that's that's typically go-getters that, that that are that that are excel that excel at whatever they do um talk a little bit about how you've been able to include family into this profession when it's you know i mean there's a lot of people that it, think that you can't have, be a good dad or a good a, a good mom and be a great strength coach so I've got an incredibly supportive wife and I think the two best children in the world, <laughs> they're crazy. Uh, my children aren't, I'm my wife. Uh, my children are crazy. And, and, um, and I, they love coming to the weight room and my athletes know them by name. My athletes love seeing them when my wife comes by, whether it's to drop off something for me or just to say, Hey, I'll pick up my son. He's five years old and walk around the weight room with him. I've done that since he was a baby and since my daughter was and, I'll cover his ears and blow the whistle for the next set. And, um, you know, just being able to have them included. And we have uh, every spring I, I do a senior recognition night at my house. So all the seniors that have been a part of our training program and made a really big impact, they'll come over to my house. And I want my wife there. I want my children there. So they get to see my family again. And it's my way of, of 
being able to recognize them and I'll write an individual letter to each one of those athletes and read it in front of everybody else. And um, it's been special for me for that reason, but also because my, my daughter's out there playing with, with our senior boys. Like uh, this past year was the first year my daughter played softball. Well, our starting running back that was a senior last year was pitching balls to her in my backyard when we did that senior night. And that's something that she'll always remember. Um, you know, the, the guy that she wanted to take a picture with after football games was throwing softballs to her. My son is over there with three of our, our female athletes just running around with them all, all night, and, and it meant the world to him. So um, one of the great things about being in high school is being able to involve your kids and the love that your athletes show to those kids is incredible. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. And it's, uh, you know, I, I speak um, on building culture. And one of the things that I, I talk about is including your family into that, into that, because I think it's so important for our athletes to see us as human beings and not just as robots, you know, and blow a whistle, you know, and, and many of them are coming from broken homes that don't really have a model of what the family dynamics should look like. You know, and so being able to share the wins and the losses within a family and, and talk about, you know, how you work through problems or how, you know, how it's not, it's not, you know, completely always peachy. It's sometimes it's bumpy as well that you got to, you know, you got to work through. Those are important pieces of the pie, I think, for helping to educate these athletes, not just in the weight room, but for the, you know, for, for the challenge of life. And, um, so important. So I'm, I'm so glad that you do that on a regular basis. And I'm, I'm glad that you, you talk about it, you know, amongst your peers um, and, and, and demonstrate that vulnerability um, and that, and that leadership, because I think it's, it's so important as we go, man, we had the, we had the show with some uh, resources here. Give us the best piece of coaching advice you ever received. So my high school head coach and current head of school, um, Great football coach, but he used to tell us all the time, football is a great game, but it's a lousy God. And I remember hearing him say that, and I'm like, you're the football coach. This is supposed to be, the, you know, one of the biggest things in the world to you. And it was his way of explaining to us that, and he would obviously delve into it deeper, but it, it was his way of telling us that, you know, this sport's going to go by the wayside. And the, there are a lot of things more important in life than just this, but the lessons that we learn through this game is what's going to help prepare you for life. And to me, you can interchange that word football with so many things and strength and conditioning is a great thing, but it's a lousy God. And if I make everything about my kids' numbers in the weight room or their numbers on the track or whatever, then I'm going to lose perspective. And I've got to remember that I'm dealing with people here, not just athletes. They're people first. And um, my focus has to be on how I'm developing them. Now, obviously, We've got to get stronger. We've got to get faster. We've got to do all those things. But one of my most important parts of, of our program is our character and leadership development. So that, that piece of coaching advice is still with me. Yeah, that's fantastic. Give us a uh, book, app, and website recommendation. And so my book is uh, – it's an old one, but I think every coach, male or female, ought to read it. Um, and it's Inside Out Coaching uh, by Joe Ehrman. I was able to hear him speak a few years ago at a conference. and, and <laughs> Right there. Um, I think it's, I think it's priceless. I think every coach ought to read it. Um, I actually had a coach that came and visited me a couple months ago and my head football coach and I were talking to him about it. There are actually two guys the same day and my head football coach um, and I were talking about inside out coaching to him. And my, my football coach is one of the greatest guys and he had an extra copy and he, he gave it to one of the coaches. And the other coach was sitting there, and I was like, crap, he didn't get a book. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Louie asked him, he said, hey, do you have that book? I just thought you did. And he said, no, I don't. So unbeknownst to me or the other coach, Louie ordered it and had it sent, sent to his house the next day. Well, I saw that coach a couple of weeks ago, and he just could not stop talking about how much that book changes perspective. And this is a guy that, that's in his early 40s. Wow. He read that book for the first time. And it challenged him to change his coaching style and, and the way that he does things. And I think, you know, every coach that starts his coaching journey should read that and get a perspective on how he's going to treat he or she is going to treat their athletes and um, what the perspective is on it. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Any apps or websites? 
Uh, two apps that I use a, a, probably on a daily basis are Coach's Eye and Team Builder. Neither one of those new to probably many coaches on here, but um, Coach's Eye obviously is a great tool for me to help when one of my kids isn't doing something right, being able to show them their video, but also to be able to pull up somebody doing it correctly right beside them and compare the two videos and to see it click with them. And then obviously Team Builder for our um, – for our daily surveys, our readiness programs, and then to, to spit out programs uh, for our kids. Awesome. Well, man, like I said, I mean, there's no, there's no secret to me, or it's no, um, you know, that you've had the success that you've had, and why you're, the, why you're the reigning strength coach of the year. I mean, first and foremost, I think when you talk about, you know, Joe Armand's book and transactional versus transformative coaching, I mean, I think that's what you're doing on a daily basis, and incorporating your family uh, into that. Um, and keeping your athletes front and center uh, in, in your in your motivations makes all the other stuff go, you know, easier. You know, uh, sets reps, relationships with the coaches, parents, administration. Whenever you do that, and and the and the players love you, and 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 they, and, uh, they know that you care about them, then you can accomplish and, and get through any of that type of stuff. And so. Um, it's obvious why you're, you're, uh, successful and, and I just appreciate the way that you're going about your business and, and, and how, um, open you are about it. I think that that's a, I think that's another, I think that's the next step for a lot of coaches is, is really being able to demonstrate kind of that vulnerability and being able to talk about loving your kids, loving your, your spouse, loving, you know, your athletes, um, sharing your wins and your losses. And, um, I think you do that on a regular basis and I respect you for it. I appreciate it, Coach. I appreciate the influence you've been on on me and so many other coaches and how you've gone through your journey with your book and with your podcast that, that you know, it reaches thousands of coaches and um, not just from, like you said, a sets and reps, but uh, the vulnerability that you've shown in your book and, and uh, it really opens up a lot of eyes. Appreciate that. That's it for this episode of Iron Game Chalk Talk. Thanks to this week's guest as well as our sponsors for bringing this episode to you for free. Make sure to check out ronmckeefree.com where you can join our mailing list, find the show notes, including all the links and resources mentioned, and information about Coach McKeefree's other products. While you are there, please join Coach McKeefree in the comments section thanking our guest for sharing. If you haven't subscribed to Iron Game Chalk Talk on YouTube or iTunes yet, make sure to do so. Comments, ratings, and reviews are always welcome. Coach McKeefree can be found on Twitter at rmckeefree on Facebook and YouTube at forward slash Ron dot McKeefrey. That's it for this week. Be sure to check back next week for another great episode of Iron Game Chalk Talk.